Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me so regularly uh, to the President's Conference. The question I wanted to ask myself, because the subject is so broad, world order, is the following. What will the 21st century be called? Will it be like many commentators, analysts are telling us, will it be called the Asian century or the Chinese century? Will it be a new American century? Will it be, it seems daring, but some people have said it, the European century? Will it be a multipolar century? Uh, let me try to analyze very quickly those various hypotheses. I do not think historians will call the 21st century neither the Asian or the Chinese century. I think China will continue to grow and become stronger and stronger as time goes by. But I don't think by the end of the day it will be the Chinese or the Asian century. Why? Somewhere, it's the first time in history that a country comes to prominence without carrying any universal message, but really only preoccupied with its own return as a civilization on the world stage. And the contradictions within China abound. There is a beautiful sentence what I read, that I read recently that summarizes it. If China does not tackle corruption, the country is doomed. But if China tackles corruption, the party is doomed. And I think it encapsulates a fundamental uh, contradiction, uh, which is not necessarily present in the Western democratic world, which is what is good for the country is bad for the government of the country. Second point, but it goes in the other direction. And this is why I don't think the contradictions within China will explode in a negative and contradictory manner. There are three key words which pushes me to give hope in the continuation of Chinese growth. The first one is confidence. There's the confidence in a civilization that knew what power meant, that was at the center of world history up till the end of the 18th century. Then there is beyond confidence, humiliation. They remember the humiliation they found themselves in because of their decadence, and they don't want to see that again. And the third word is probably fear. Fear of chaos, fear of the return of violence. I mean, when I look at China today, it reminds me a little bit of Spain after the Civil War. So much blood has been spilled. The country remembers vividly those terrible experiences where tens of millions of Chinese died because of the political experiences of a once Baroque regime. So I don't think by the end of the day the 21st century will be called the century of China. Will it be called, like the 20th century, the American century? I mean, two centuries, it's not that long. Uh, the Romans did much longer. And uh, I mean, America has been a giant uh, for a few decades. Uh, so maybe uh, we should give them a chance. I'm just back from the United States. I'm struck by the return of optimism. 
by the sheer energy of the country. In a way, we are not yet aware of it, but America is back. There is something which is being discussed, which would be like the equivalent of a third industrial revolution, the simulation energy. Yes, the number of Nobel Prizes makes a difference. Yes, the investment in research, in excellence, in the top American university makes a difference. And yes, the United States are going to be independent in energy terms in 2016, 2018, 2020, in the coming years. But there is also something that is imperial fatigue. That is a real necessity which is shared by the Americans and the Chinese to concentrate on the weaknesses of their systems. There are, within China and within America, clear dysfunctioning. The dysfunctioning of American democracy is obvious, real. Uh, the uh, uh, philosopher from uh, Japanese origin, Francis Fukuyama, has said not long ago that American vetocracy was threatening American democracy. And that is a certainty. And so, in a way, in spite of the fact that America is back economically, probably socially, probably in their head, I don't think they are ready, willing, or capable to play the role they played before. Not only because the rest of the world has been catching up, but somewhere also because America is not exactly what they used to be. The unipolar moment of the United States between 1990, 1991, and 2001 will really remain a unipolar moment. So, no American century again. A European century, that sounds like a sheer provocation. Uh, but it has been written and said, uh, the strength of the most human model, the land of reconciliation, of peace, the land of human capitalism, Europe has a lot for itself, except Europe does not exist. And that is a major problem. No, what we are witnessing is a process of fragmentation that has never been so deep within Europe. You have really Northern Europe behind Germany. You've seen the confidence, even in appearance, of my uh, German uh, friend, uh, Joe Joffe, and unfortunately, a Southern Europe, which I would say my country is joining, uh, which is not so strong. I mean, France used to be closer to Germany, now we seem not to be playing in the same league. And that is a sign of diffidence for us. And in fact, even the Germans are worried because they know they need a strong France if we want to see a strong Europe. So it is not going to be the European century. But I would urge you, I would warn you, I think it would be too early, too premature, to bury Europe. Business leaders know better. They continue to invest in Europe. There are a lot of good things still taking place there. But at the same time, we have to reinvent our narrative. How could you sell Europe to countries when more than 50% of the young are unemployed? Yes. It's less painful to go to the dentist, but it's much more painful not to have a job and not to see an opportunity for a job in the coming months or in the coming years. That is the real cancer that threatens Europe. That is the real reason why populism is such 
a threat to Europe, populism in its various incarnation. You have populism the old way of the 1930s in countries like Greece or Hungary, where xenophobia and antisemitism run high. Then you have populism against the political class in a country like Italy. You have populism against the elite at large in a country uh, like mine, uh, France. You have populism against Brussels and against the others in Great Britain through the UKIP. But the real reason for populism is, of course, by the end of the day, the rise of unemployment and the lack of hope that governments will find a solution to the situation that there is. So what will, and I will conclude like that, I see that my time is coming to an end. What will the 21st century be called like? Probably by the end of the day, the multipolar century. Multipolarity uh, has always been more or less the norm in the international systems which were ruled in the which we've known in the past. But up till the 19th century, we called in Europe multipolarity the concert of Europe. There was a sense of harmony. The actors were all alike. They were all looking for the status quo. At the level of diplomats, they all spoke the same language. Mine, sorry, <laughs> French. <laughs> Is there a link between the loss of the French language and the disharmony of the world? I would not go as far <laughs> to saying that. Uh, but uh, the multipolarity of the world today evokes to me the cacophony and the cacophony here again is linked to the sense that we don't understand, that there are no referees. The United States are no longer the referee. The UN are less than ever the referee. And the world has become so interconnected, interdependent, and transparent that in some way we run the risk of being united by fear. Fear of the future, fear of the other, fear of not understanding what's going to happen to us. And that is the most dangerous scenario. Because as we know, fear nothing but fear itself. This is really uh, the message I wanted to end with. Thank you.